I'm quite excited about this week's learning. We're going to talk about some of the unsafe practices that electricians once used but are no longer acceptable. I'm sure I'll come across some of these in the future. If an electrician says that your home electrics feature any of these, then just trust them and get them modernized. By the end of this, you'll be thinking, how on earth were these practices ever acceptable? You know, it kind of reminds me of those old race cars that were a little bit top heavy and had absolutely no roll cage. Okay, they sort of had a roll cage, it was your neck. I enjoy motor racing and the crashes in say F1 certainly make it far more entertaining. But when it comes to those old cars, I'm just wincing. I don't want to see one of those crash, somebody's going to get hurt. Anyway, getting back to our unsafe practices. A lot of these unsafe electrical practices have been overruled by new releases of BS 7671 document, which electricians follow, the wiring regulations. So what are some of them? Believe it or not, in the past, people didn't rely on the earth and the supply or an earth rod. Up until 1966, people were using metal water pipes as an earthing arrangement. I wonder what happened for them to feel the need to change this. Carrying on with our earthing theme, prior to 1981, there was no requirement for equipotential bonding, meaning no need for a link to the gas and water pipe up to the main system. Since the 80s, the earthing wire sizes have been specified within those regulations. They've progressively got up to the size of our current 10 mil in most situations. What's next? Up until the 1950s, it was common to have fuses on the neutral conductors as well as the line conductors. But hopefully you can see how this was a bad idea. It could be that the neutral fuse breaks first, which then disconnects the circuit. This would mean that the line conductor would still be live. Again, I wonder what it took for them to realize the need for this to change. Back before RCDs operated the way they do now, up until say 1981, these devices operated by voltage. So when they recognized a voltage on the earth path flowing to them, they'd trip. But if there was a parallel earth path, then they'd be useless because they wouldn't have voltage flowing through them. I wonder again what it took for them to realize that this wasn't safe. Lighting circuits are a little bit different than they were in the past. No, I'm not talking as far back as candles, but before the 60s, lighting circuits often didn't come with metal switches, which meant that the wiring didn't facilitate earth wires. Nowadays, any lighting circuit installed has to have an earth. Any retrofits or replacements without an earth need a type that doesn't require an earth in order to continue using that light. In the UK, we're very familiar with our plugs, aren't we? I'm sure I'm not the only one that's come a cropper to one of these on a dark night. By, uh, you know, standing on one. Mm. Enough said, let's move on. Up until the 50s, different types of socket outlets were used. Types that had rounds pins were used. These plugs could be missing an earth or a fuse. There's still a potential to see them, but it's not really a good idea to use them. They're outdated for a reason. You may know that all outdoor equipment needs to be protected by an RCD, whether it be in the consumer unit or directly before the appliance. But up until the 80s, there was no requirement for the wiring regulations to have RCDs. I've talked before about how I feel that RCDs are one of the best improvements in the modern world of electrics. Nowadays, it's mandated to have them installed on all circuits below 32 amps. Okay, okay, on commercial there might be a way around them involving a risk assessment. Another change since the 80s is cables now have to be in zones. Older installs could have cables in all sorts of random places in the walls, floors or ceilings. Of course, 
There are ways to check, so you don't have to play Russian roulette with the drill. This shouldn't be much of an issue on new build properties. Maybe I'll just stick to working on new build properties. Hmm. In the past, two and a half mil squared twin and earth only had an earth of one mil. Whereas now these cables should be fitted with a one and a half mil cross section. This posed the risk that in exceptional circumstances, the smaller cable could mean that the fault would not necessarily be protected or detected by its reduced size. This is the sort of fault that would need a full rewire. Although I'm not sure how common it is. Have you ever seen accessories such as lights, switches or sockets mounted on a wooden board, maybe a decorative piece? This may not be the sort of thing that we see in homes, but you could imagine it on an old stately home, couldn't you? Unfortunately, we all know that wood is combustible, so it could prove dangerous if there was a fault. Imperial cables were mentioned. Apparently, up until the 70s, you could buy imperial sized cables. This meant that the current capacity is different to what you'd expect for a similar looking sized cable. Well, that's now made me panic because at this stage I thought it was easy to identify a two and a half mil cable. Whereas now all the properties that I might work on, I've got to look out for imperial cables too. I've mentioned before vulcanized rubber cables. These are cables that were used before PVC was used. They contain a type of rubber with a black exterior. They're usually easily recognizable because by now they're all crumbling apart. <laughs> strong intact cables are pretty important trying to keep the electricity away from other conductive parts they don't like the sunlight or oxygen or time or electricians apparently if you move them say for example replacing the front of a socket there's a good chance that you'll end up with exposed conductors by the end of it if these are found in a property or if you have them in your own property then i definitely recommend that you replace them when any major works are planned. Lead cables were mentioned. Before 1948, these were used. The takeaway is they're much like vulcanized rubber cables because they do actually have a rubber insulator internally for each core. So there's a good chance that over time they can lose their insulation resistance. It's also important to make sure that the outer lead is earthed to protect in fault situations. I've enjoyed talking about some of these faults. It's crazy to think that just 50, 60, 70 years ago, these things were either commonplace or seen as a good idea. Sometimes we can be a little bit health and safety mad today, but it's all for a reason. If we can still crack on and get things done, but in a safe way, it's gotta be worth it, hasn't it? The biggest problem I see though, is that if people have working electrics, how are you gonna convince them that what they have set up is unsafe when it just appears to work as far as they're concerned. You know, I'm imagining a scenario where you're in a customer's house and you've seen some faulty things or perhaps a less than ideal setup. For example, let's say you've noticed that there's no RCDs in their consumer unit. I'm yet to learn how you go about convincing them that their electrics are unsafe or not ideal when as far as they're concerned it works. It's worked fine for the last 40, 50 years. Suddenly you're telling me I need to have RCDs in all the circuits? If you're self-employed or even work for a company and have to explain this to clients or customers, I'd love to know in the comments below, how do you get on with this? Do you sometimes find it a challenge to convince the public that they need to make improvements? I'd also love to know what electrical faults you've seen I've joined a few Facebook groups and every so often you see something that's been installed and it's pretty dodgy. To me, it looks like it's not always the DIYers that carry out unsafe practices, but it looks like all electricians 40, 50, 60 years ago were doing that too. Maybe even kitchen fitters now, hey? Different countries have different practices and standards. How are things done where you live? Next week, we'll talk about self-employment. The whole point of becoming an electrician is to earn money, right? An electrician has two ways of doing that, whether it be through employment or self-employment. I've been self-employed for years, so it'll be interesting to see what we can learn next week and apply to for all trades and for all types of self-employment. See you next week.
battery man out.